I always ask this uh, very interesting question. What's the prognosis for a tooth after you break your file? You're doing the root canal, you break your file in the canal. What's the prognosis for that tooth? I can talk a couple of days about this topic. It all starts with whether or not you were using a rubber dam or not. If you were using a rubber dam, that's great. We all break files. <clears throat> the more root canals you do, the more likelihood that you break files. Patient education and consent, of course, is very important. If you if you didn't use a rubber dam and you broke a file, that puts everything under a big question mark, legally and ethically for you. There's justification for file breakage if you were using a rubber dam. If you weren't, then forget it. We want to talk about the other factor, which is the pulpal status of the tooth. The pulpal status is important because if it was a vital pulp, then the prognosis is much better than if you break a file in a tooth that is that the pulp the pulp was necrotic and contaminated and infected. Infected pulp, necrotic pulp, contaminated, infected pulp. Okay, so the prognosis is, is, is much worse if you break a file in a necrotic tooth. Why? Because of the presence of bacteria. Of course, there's bacteria in the canals and you break a file in the tooth. You haven't had the chance to fully irrigate instrument and shape the, the canal and you break a file, okay? When you break a file is also important. Did you break a file right in the beginning? Or did you break a file in the middle of the procedure? Like, you, you had the chance to somewhat instrument, shape, and irrigate the canal that you broke the file in? Or did you break a file after complete instrumentation, shaping, and irrigation? All right, so if you break a file in a necrotic contaminated tooth canal, right in the beginning, the prognosis is terrible because you broke a file in the beginning, you, had, you hadn't had the chance, when you hadn't had the chance to instrument shape and irrigate the canal yet. If you break a file in the middle of the session, treatment session, that means that you had the chance now to somewhat, somewhat instrument shape and irrigate the canal and you broke a file. Okay, so the prognosis is a little bit better because the bacterial load is less. It all has to do with the bacterial load. If you break a file in a canal that wasn't even instrumented, shaped, and irrigated in the beginning, then the bacterial load is so much that the, that's why the prognosis drops significantly. But if you break a file in the middle of the procedure, then the prognosis is better. If you break a file near the end of the procedure, or the end of the procedure, which means that you, you, you had the chance to fully instrument, shape, and irrigate the canal, then the prognosis becomes much, much better. The prognosis is much, much better. So. Those are some of the factors that determine the prognosis for a, for a tooth when you break a file in it, whether or not a rubber dam was used. Uh, the, your file also is in it before. Was, was the file sterile? Was the file clean? Did you break a file? The, the same file, did you break the same file that you placed in the canal initially, which means now this file is contaminated. We're talking about a necrotic contaminated pulp. Did you break the same file that you placed in the canal initially? So the file carries now within its flutes, bacteria, did you break that same file in the canal? That also is important. And of course, as I said, the stage. What stage did you break the file? What stage of the treatment? Did you break the file in the beginning? Success rate is very, success rate is very, very guarded. Did you break a file in the middle of the procedure when you had the chance to uh, instrument shape and uh, clean and irrigate the canal? The success rate is a little bit better. Or did you break the file uh, near the end of the procedure or at the end of the procedure when you had the chance to fully instrument shape and irrigate the canal? All right, so those are some of the factors that determine the success, the, the, the prognosis and the success rate of the, of the root canal uh, when you break a file. It all has to do with the bacterial load uh, and at what, again, at what stage of the procedure did the file break. In the beginning, the bacterial load in the canals is, is very high, so that's why the success rate drops in the middle of the procedure. Bacterial load is, is less, so the success rate, the prognosis is a, is, a, is a little bit better. At the end of the procedure, if you break a file, then the success rate is much better. Uh, it's a good, they have a good success rate because you had the chance to uh, fully instrument shape and irrigate the canal um, when you broke the file, that file. So those are the things that I want you to think about. Again, we all, we're talking about bacteria and their byproducts and the less of bacteria and their byproducts in the canal when you break a file, the better the success rate becomes. Question that was in Farsi and I responded in Farsi. <laughs> I got so many messages. What are you talking about? What are you, what are you saying? Okay, so this follower's question was, in some cases, for example, he cannot get patency in certain canals. For example, he can't get patency in the MV2 canal of the upper molars sometimes. And sometimes referral to an endodontist is not an option. So he was wondering now, because he can't get patency and, and the pulp is vital. So he can't get patency because the pulp is vital in that MV2 canal and he uses rubber dam and what have you. 
So it uses rubber dams, assuming that you use rubber dam for 6% sodium chloride and everything is sterile and clean. Is it okay that he can't get patency in these canals, vital canals sometimes, for example, in the MB2 of the upper motors? Is it okay to leave tissue behind? And my response was, first of all, you need to find out, figure out why you can't get patency. What's the reason you can't get patency in, let's say, the MB2 canal? Or in some canals, why? Why can't you get patency? And because we don't like to leave tissue behind, even though the tissue is, could be vital. We, don't, we still don't want to leave pulp tissue behind. Why don't we want to leave pulp tissue behind? Because tissue, pulp tissue, soft tissue, pulp tissue, can be used by bacteria. It's food to bacteria. So we don't want to leave tissue behind, yet vital or what have you, because we're leaving potential food for these microorganisms. Now, how do you know that you have a sterile environment? So because you're assuming that, okay, I have a vital pulp, it's sterile, therefore, if I can't get patency to remove the remainder of the pulp tissue from within the canal, then I should be okay, right? You're assuming that the pulp, pulp tissue is sterile. How do you know that the pulp tissue is sterile? What if you have a little leak in your, in your rubber dam and you get a little bit of saliva and bacteria contaminating the canal? How do you know that the file you're using is sterile? It could, it could have been sterile, but when, when you use the file during act, the usage of the file, what if the file was not sterile anymore? So therefore you introduced microorganisms that were residing on the file into the, into the canal. That was, a, was, let's say, assume was sterile to begin with. So, but you introduced bacteria into the canal during the, the filing process. Or as I said, if you have a little leak from the rubber dam that wasn't sealed properly, little saliva and bacteria leaking, leaking down the canal. If your file touches the rubber dam, it could, it could be contaminated. If your file, as you're trying to insert it into the canal, you're having a hard time, and it touches the tooth itself, the file could get contaminated. So you're carrying that contamination, which is basically bacteria, down into the canal. So now you're introducing bacteria down into the canal, and you left food in the form of the part of the pulp tissue that you couldn't remove. That's a recipe for disaster, right? So now you need to figure out why you can't get patency. And a lot of times when clinicians, some clinicians cannot get patency is because they rush. They rush things. So it's their own doing. It's iatrogenic. They rush. Sometimes they rush because they, they just want to get it done. Sometimes they rush because they're so excited. Once they find that canal, let's say MB2, once they have a little file in it, they want to put, they want to, they want to go use that one file to go all the way to the working length and get patency. So they get overexcited instead of taking their time and using the crown down technique, just removing a little bit at a time, irrigating, removing a little bit of the tissue at a time, going, going down the canal or up the canal. A little bit at a time, they get excited, they get overexcited, and they want to put that, that one file, because they got it in the canal, and they want to gain patency right away. So what they do is, they basically, as they're pushing the, the file into the canal, they're folding, they're folding the, the pulp tissue over onto itself. And in the process, as they do that, as they fold the pulp tissue over onto itself, by pressing on the file, and the tip of the file doing so, they block themselves. Also, they could probably have another thing that doesn't help is if they have hypochlorite, sodium hypochlorite in the canal. So they fill the pulp, pulp chamber and the canal with sodium hypochlorite in a vital case. That's why we don't like to use um, sodium hypochlorite um, when we have a vital case. We like, we prefer to use a viscous agent like RC prep in the beginning. Because sodium hypochlorite, one thing that it does is, hypo basically what it does is, as I was saying, is that it dissolves part of the pulp tissue, uh, but leaves the connective tissue. It doesn't dissolve the connective tissue of the pulp. And that connective tissue is like, when it's, when it's uh, uh, folded on, onto itself, it's like leather. So you're just constantly exposing the dissolving part of the uh, pulp tissue that the, the, the hypo can dissolve, leaving the part of the pulp tissue that and it, it's like leather. And you just fold that over onto itself, and therefore you create a blockage. And that's why, as I said, we like to use, uh, in the beginning, in vital cases, we like to use a viscous uh, agent, such as uh, RC prep, because it keeps everything in uh, emulsification. So it keeps everything in suspension, it emulsifies things, it keeps everything in suspension. The moral, the moral of the story here is that be careful, you don't want to leave tissue behind assuming that, the, that what, what you're leaving behind is sterile and the environment in which you're leaving, leaving the pulp tissue behind is sterile because that, those are just assumptions, you don't know. And, uh, and work on your technique. Try not to go from um, the, the orifice of the canal to the desired working length of the canal with one file because chances are that you, in the process, you can because you're overexcited, you can block yourself. And also, in the beginning, in vital cases, don't use sodium hypochlorite. Use um, something like RC prep. I've gone over all of this. I'm going over, over them again. So hopefully, this will answer some of your questions.